All right, g'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, and today we are finally going to have a crack at a bit of a ladder prediction for the season ahead, that is 2022. Of course, we are just about all the way through the preseason games. I believe there's one left today with Gold Coast Suns and Geelong, but I feel like we've seen enough now where we can maybe get a feel of how teams are traveling. I know it's only preseason, but I still, I still think it's worth a look to see, you know, form lines, how new players are acclimatizing to their new club, what players are likely to be available for the start of the season, and so on and so forth. Now, I must admit, I hate doing these videos. I know that ladder prediction videos are popular in general, but they are notoriously hard to get right. I remember last year I had a couple of howlers because I, I like to have a few big calls in each ladder prediction, but last year I tipped the, the dogs to be the team that slid out of the top eight, and of course they made the grand final. So on that basis, I'm sure I'm going to get some of these horrifically wrong as well, but no YouTube channel is complete without some form of ladder prediction. So in today's video, I'm going to rattle through the order from 18th to 1st and give you some of the award predictions as well, but we are going to be doing a more in-depth preview of the season. Uh, I think next weekend, Bush and I will be recording the True Footy podcast as well. So in addition to today's video, you will also get a podcast with all of that content as well. So the True Footy YouTube channel is officially back for 2022 and with it, our sponsors, Manscaped.com, who have done a great job of sponsoring us through this off-season as well. So just in case you've forgotten, you can definitely go to Manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping on their elite male grooming products. And we can say, that there is an exciting announcement that we will be showing you guys in this weekend's podcast as well. So keep an eye out for that. It's related to Manscaped and some of the cool things they've got cooking up over there as well. But for the time being, make sure you check out their website. You can get 20% off and free shipping. Like I said, you just have to use the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout. So make sure you go do that, get yourself some great products and you'd be supporting the channel as well. And before we kick off, it appears that about 35% of the people who have watched my videos this summer are not subscribed to the channel. So that number is actually better. We're moving in the right direction. However, if you do enjoy the content and want some football content throughout 2022 to get you by, make sure you do consider subscribing to the channel. You'd be hopefully getting yourself a treat if uh, if you enjoy the content, but also you'd be supporting the channel as well. So thank you guys. But enough waffle, let's get into the ladder prediction. So starting at the bottom of the ladder, I am going to go with Collingwood here. And the reason for that is fairly simple. I think it's clear that they're in quite a rebuild mode. They're a pretty top heavy list. The top end quality is really good with, you know, guys like Darcy Moore, Grundy, Degoe, uh, Howe, Crisp, Taylor Adams, Braden Maynard had a great year last year. And of course, the Evergreen, Scott Pendlebury. So it's the layer below that that concerns me a little bit. And they've done a really good job of cycling through some young talent. They've hit the draft hard the last couple of years. They've added Nick Dacos as well as some guys like Bianca. Yanko, McRae, Poulter, McCreary, and Oliver Henry actually showed some really good signs last year as well. So on that logic, I think they're just going to have a year where the kids are going to get a lot of games and they're going to struggle to be competitive. Factor in the new coach as well, where the expectations are fairly low. I think McRae's going to get this rebuild right. And thus, I think it's going to be a long-term view at Collingwood this year. So I can I can see them avoiding the wooden spoon, of course, but they're my pick right now. 17th, we're going to go with the Gold Coast Suns. And this is a bit of a an easy one just because people always notoriously expect Gold Coast coast to finish low on the ladder and to be fair they're usually right. Stewie Jew's in the last year of his contract and it's a big year for him so he's going to want to see some genuine improvement but for me it's just hard to make a case for that improvement coming. They had Ben King really make a name for himself last year. He looks like one of the best young key forward talents in the competition and now he's out with an ACL and he was generally an important avenue to goal for them last year so I know they're talking about Lukosius going forward but if you take out one of their primary goal kickers, in fact their best goal kicker, as much as you can see the young midfield coming on like Rao will come back into the side. I think Anderson showed some really good signs last year amongst others. If they're struggling to kick goals then I don't think they're going to finish very high on the ladder, to be honest. And I, I can see them having that typically good start to the year and then falling away poorly. So for me, still not enough experience on the list to back them any higher than 17th. In 16th, I've got the Adelaide Football Club who finished last in 2020, I think second last last year. So they're going to move up one spot this year. And I just think the reality is they've still got a bit to go in terms of their rebuild. They've cut some experience from their list this off season, some more important than others. Jake Kelly joined Essendon, but they also parted ways with Tom Lynch, Bryce Gibbs, David McKay or Mackay, or whoever he says it, and Daniel Talia as well. That's not the reason I expect them to stay low because I don't think they relied on those players, but I think the reality is they're going to have a lot of kids to, to get games into. And I think they drafted well. Rochelle looks like an absolute star. That Saligo guy looked pretty good as well. And they've also traded in Jordan Dawson, but I don't think it's enough to see them rise up the ladder. When Adelaide are good, they are really good, but it's obviously few and far between at this stage being at such a young side. So they may bob up and win a few upsets, but I still have them in the bottom four. Rounding out the bottom four, and it's a pretty uncontroversial 
controversial bottom four, to be honest. I'm going to go with North Melbourne, a team that people are picking to improve this year. And to be fair, I've still got them in the bottom four, but they did finish last last year. So if they climb three or four spots, that is still actually pretty acceptable improvement, in my opinion. They had some injury woes last year. You had some important experienced players miss a lot of football with McDonald, Cunnington, Jed Anderson, Aiden Cord, to name a few. They've also continued a bit of a clean out with guys like Atlee, Dumont, and Tarrant leaving the club over the offseason. So again, like the other teams I mentioned, just a team that's got a lot of young kids to give games to. I think they had a really good offseason. They added Hugh Greenwood, Callum Coleman-Jones, and of course the number one pick, Jason Horn francis amongst their other draft picks as well. But just like the Crows, I think they'll bob up and have a few good wins, but ultimately too young to really push higher than bottom four. So now we're past the bottom four, and I'm going to start rolling through some teams that I find very, very hard to separate. And to be honest, I think I'm going to potentially get this one wrong. I'm going to start with Hawthorne, but I will highlight the fact that I think we're starting to get into the teams that I think genuinely could play final. So I think Hawthorne could finish as high as 7th or 8th, but I'm going to hedge my bets here and have them in 14th. I find them really, really hard to play, so I think they've got a good, mature midfield. Tom Mitchell, you know, returned to some of his best form last year. I thought he was really good, and some other good sort of midfielders in O'Meara, Warple, and Chad Wingard, of course. They're going to add Josh Ward to that, who I think will be a player in his first season. Looks pretty ready to go. I think their back line is actually their strength, and you're adding Sicily to guys like Giath Day and Scrimshaw as well. So out of the back half, they've got a lot of run and carry, and I think they might even have a little bit of an issue trying to place all those guys in the same team. Someone like a Will Day may play up the ground a little bit more. On the flip side, I think avenues to goal will continue to be a bit of an issue for them. Obviously, you've got Gunston and Bruce, who are absolute superstars, but their other young talents in Mitchell and Lewis, while they are definitely talented, hard to back them in to kick a lot of goals. So I think that's probably the weakness in their best 22. I really, really rate Sam Mitchell as an Eagles fan, and so many Eagles fans are big fans of Sam Mitchell and the impact he had here. I think he's going to be a fantastic coach. I just find it hard to peg exactly how they're going to go in his first season. So I think they could play finals, but I'm going to hedge my bets and say probably 14th-ish. Next up, in 13th, I'm going to go with my beloved West Coast Eagles. And again, I'm so unsure of where to place us, to be honest. I, I really don't want to feed into the negative narrative in the media at the moment that, you know, we, we got trounced in the first preseason game and the injuries are starting to pile up and then there's Darling. I, I tend to think we kind of get caught in a loop of negative media sort of attention and we're probably underrating West Coast a little bit. I include myself in that because I really hope we're going to finish higher than 13th. And I do think we can play finals, to be honest. The injuries have been well documented. I think they're a little bit over-reported. We are going to get a fair few of those players back in the first month of the season where we've got a relatively easy run. So I'm still quite optimistic in that sense. Avenues to goal will be the issue. Jack Darling is absolutely a huge loss, not just now, but in the medium term over the next three or four years. So it's sort of forced us to really reconsider who the next key forward is going to be to support Oscar Allen. What they need to do is find avenues to goal through guys like Waterman and Allen. And I think those guys could bob up for, you know, 30, 35 goal seasons. Absolutely. So I think the ceiling for West Coast is probably an away first week of finals, but I could see it unraveling as well. And while I liked what we saw in the second preseason game against Fremantle with so many injured players, I think I find it hard to place my boys above some of the teams I'm about to mention. Next, we've got the Saints, another team that is very, very hard to place, and I'm probably underrating them a little bit this year. Could they do a sort of Melbourne-like revival where they bounce out of finals and then back in dramatically? Probably would say they don't quite have the same upside as a Melbourne did 12 months ago, but that doesn't mean they can't play finals, and they are well and truly in that sort of group of finals aspirants. Last year, it fell apart badly for them. I think fitness and injuries were largely a factor. They certainly weren't the only team that that happened to, but they kind of put in both terrific performances in some games and really, really horrific performances. Some of their worst performances, much like West Coast last year, were probably some of the worst in the competition. But then they also, you know, beat Brisbane. They also trounced Richmond. I think they held them to their lowest score in 60 years. Long story short, I find it hard to place them, but I'm going to place them below some of these other finals aspirants. Next up in 11th, this is going to be an unpopular one, but I'm going to put Essendon here just because I feel like they might just get leapfrogged this year. I think they took big strides last year. There's absolutely no doubt about that. The way their midfield stepped up, led by Darcy Parrish, getting all the way to the finals and putting in some really good performances along the way. And I, I just, I feel like their youth is outstanding, some of their youth anyway. But whether or not it's ready to take the next step to support guys like Parrish who stepped up last year, look, maybe. They, they could definitely play finals. But let's be honest, it was a pretty weak sort of top eight race last year. And will they improve enough against the competition to make finals again? Maybe, but I'm probably not going to bet on it. On the plus side, I think Peter Wright has been a 
fantastic acquisition for them. And if he bobs up and plays a regular role up forward and, you know, kicks 35 to 40 goals, they're probably going to play finals again. For me, I reckon it's probably a year of stagnation and then watch out for them in 2023. In 10th spot, I've got the Richmond Tigers, who of course fell away with injury poorly in 2021, of course being reigning premiers that year. It is very hard to bet against the side with Dusty in it, and he had that bloody kidney laceration last year as well. So it wasn't just Dusty that missed football, though. You had a whole heap of players miss, and I think they really missed someone like Noah Bolter in the back half of that year, but they have recruited Robbie Tarrant to sort of come in and also replace David Asprey. On paper, I don't really rate their midfield, to be honest. I think that's an area they really, really need to recruit for, and from all reports they tried to last year. I think it will be a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde season for Richmond where some games they trounce a contender and then other games they look listless. So that's why I don't have them higher than 10th. In ninth spot, cruelly missing out in finals. This is a spot nobody wants to finish in and that's of course where the Eagles finished last year. But I've got the Carlton Footy Club and... Based on logic rather than gut feel, they, they need to improve, surely. It's certainly the most mature and well-rounded 22 I've seen from Carlton in a number of years, and two big recruits in Adam Chera and George Hewitt, who I think has been going pretty well in the preseason. Then, of course, there's the form of Patrick Cripps, and if he comes good, then that really elevates them to a genuine finals contender. But I'm starting to see the midfield take shape. You've got Cripps, Walsh, Chera, and Hewitt amongst the other guys that they have already have. Then you've got Mackay up forward, who is the reigning Coleman medalist, and Kerno back into the side. Fingers crossed he gets a good run at it. Jacob Weidering is one of the best young key backs in the league, if not the best, to be honest. And I still have faith in recruits like Zach Williams and Adam Saad adding a bit of rebound for them. So it's not a fully formed side, but for me on paper, it's definitely finals quality. So I can see them going close, but ultimately I have them just outside the eight. In eighth spot, and I hate doing this because there has been so much Fremantle hype since the first preseason derby, but I'm going to say Fremantle slide into the eight this year. For me, the biggest obstacle for Fremantle is their injuries. It's been their massive Achilles heel, no pun intended, over the last you know three or four years. Have they been a finals-like side over the last few years? I think fair to say no, even considering the injuries. But you're starting to see a real game plan take shape under Justin Longmuir, and the way they move the ball albeit in sort of low pressure conditions, uh, has been pretty impressive this offseason. So they've generally got good rebound in guys like Hayden Young, Jordan Clark, Luke Ryan, someone like Heath Chapman bobbed up in the preseason game as well. So he looks like he could become a best 22 player very, very quickly. I'm a big fan of their midfielders in Brayshaw and Sarong, and it's probably just for them finding reliable avenues to go. It's kind of a hole in their list they haven't quite plugged yet. Tabner is well and truly capable of kicking 40, 45 snags a year. And I do like the mix with their small forwards in Schultz and Switkowski. It really gives them a different dynamic up forward. I think they're going to be hard enough to beat at home this year where they're good enough to play finals. I think it's pretty 50-50 at this stage, but I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to I'm going to lock in Fremantle. In seventh spot, slightly stagnating, I've got the Sydney Swans, another one that people are sort of picking for the top four and gee, may maybe they're right. Not really staking a massive claim that I think that they're going to, you know, stagnate, but it wouldn't be surprising considering, you know, how young that team is. And it's rare that a young team who has a really great year is always able to back it up the following year. Last year, they looked at times like one of the best teams in the competition. I think people were saying they had the best game plan or at least the most attractive style. I wouldn't be surprised if opposition teams do their homework on how to stop Sydney. On that basis, I think they might have their work cut out for them. And that's why I think they'll probably stay around the same part. They finished sixth last year and I've got them seventh now. So not a really big drop, but it might not be the year they take that big jump into the top four. That might be next year. In a bit of an upset, I have got GWS in my top six and I've probably been backing GWS far too long now. I think I just really rate their potential. They've got a good blend of, you know, established talent, elite established talent at that, and also some really good young kids that we kind of forget about a little bit because it's GWS and they always seem to have high picks, but, you know, some of the young talent they've recruited over the last few years, there's a lot of upside there. So the established talent in guys like Whitfield and Toby Green, who are absolute stars, Tim Taranto there as well, Nick Haynes, then some of the younger guys they've brought in, like Lockie Ash, I think is really ready to take the next step at AFL level. Isaac Cumming was really good in the back half last year, and, and Sam Taylor is one of the best young key backs in the league as well. They've lost Finn Lace and Cameron the year before as well. So avenues to goal for them, again, is going to be a question mark. Toby Green's also missing the first five rounds of the season. So that is a big obstacle for them. But if someone like Jesse Hogan can play 22 games and kick 45 goals, then I think GWS are good enough to play finals and potentially win one. So last year, I felt that there was a strong top five or six. And again, this year, I've got a very similar top five to last year. In fact, it's the same top five, but the order is mixed around a little bit. To be honest, I find it hard to separate them between fifth and first but I'm going to have a crack at trying to get the order right. So in fifth spot, just sliding out of the top four, I've got Port Adelaide, but again, a team that I 
could see winning the minor premiership. So much upside in that team. Yes, they rely on a couple of older blokes like Travis Boak in particular, who seems to be getting better with age somehow. But I do think they've got a really good mix of those younger 21, 22, 23 year old types who could really elevate them again this year. Zach Butters only played 12 games last year. I think he has the potential to be one of their best players. Xavier Dersma also has a really big impact when he plays. And of course, everyone knows about Connor Rosie as well. Mitch Georgiatis bobs up and kicks four in a preseason game. Again, another superstar talent in my opinion. So you've got a team with some really good older senior players. I didn't even mention Ollie Wines who won the Brownlow medal, but also some of these really good sort of under 24 types. I think they're set up for some sustained success, but probably just have them sliding a little bit just because, you know, their form against the best teams last year was ultimately what cost them going deep into September. Well, in fairness, they did make a prelim, but let's be honest, other than beating Geelong in week one and Geelong were out of form, that's a big question mark they need to answer. But I still think they were a genuine premiership contender, even though I've got them in fifth. In the fourth spot, I'm going Geelong and this is a boring one. And I think people like to see Geelong fall down ladder predictions because it seems almost inevitable. But I think, to be honest, it's still wishful thinking. They had a terrible end of the season last year. You can blame it on the flu or whatever Chris Scott shows. Maybe that's true. But regardless, this is a team that's so consistently good. They get home games in Geelong as well, where they're pretty hard to beat. And their best 22 just stacks up. They've still got Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins as their two pillars up forward. And yes, I do think they could have done a better job of sort of facilitating a bit of a transition. Like where, what does the team look like in three years? They haven't really invested in the youth, but I don't think it's going to affect them this year. I think they're going to be very hard to beat. And while I'm not as confident that they'll win the flag, I still think they're going to be competitive enough and win enough games to probably finish fourth or fifth. In third spot, we've got the Western Bulldogs who absolutely proved me wrong last year. To be honest, that was kind of me just trying to make a big call. And uh, I really regret that. At halftime of the grand final, they looked like they were probably going to go on and win the whole thing. They were playing really, really well. So this is a team that's really, really not far off the benchmark of the competition and at times were probably the best team for a couple of rounds here and there last year. It's a star-studded team with a really good age mix. They've had some really good young talents come into the side and there's still a lot of upside. You know, Sam Darcy was picked three or four. They had the number one pick last year. Aaron Norton's still probably not even quite in his prime yet and I think he's already a really good player. So with Josh Bruce likely to miss most of the year with that ACL injury, it does open the door for someone like an Oogle Hagen, but the rest of the team is so solid, so established. That midfield runs so deep. With their age demographic, it's hard to pick them sliding. They do have this tendency to miss the top four. They haven't done it since about 2010, despite playing in two grand finals and winning a flag. But their top football is absolutely premium. So it's hard to have them outside my top four. I've got them in third. In second, I've got the Brisbane Lions. And again, I just can't back against them given their talent, their established talent sort of in the prime of their career. You're Lockie Neals, your Dane Zorkos. But again, like Port Adelaide, have this group of 21 to 23 year olds who look like they could really come on and be elite players. In particular, Hugh McCluggage, Jared Berry had a great preseason game. Harris Andrews is still like 25 or 26. Cam Rain is coming back from injury. Zach Bailey and Brandon Stasevich are also nowhere near hitting their prime. The only knock on Brisbane is their finals performances, but they've proven to be a good home and away team. So I think this is the year they could finally go deep. Obviously, the knock on them has been their finals performances in the last few years, but it's an experienced team for a team carrying sort of a lot of younger players as well. So again, Brisbane will go deep this year. And finally, we've got the Melbourne Football Club who in reality were, you know, just an absolute tier above the rest of the competition last year. You wouldn't have thought at halftime of the grand final, but the way they clicked into gear when the game was really there to be won just showed that they have that absolute champion mentality. And I don't really need to sell you on their list capability. Probably the best defense in the league, arguably the best midfield as well. And while their forward line probably doesn't have the, the established star power, there's still a lot of upside there. And when their midfield kicks as many goals as they do, it's hard to make a case that they're going to lack scoring power, particularly when they score 140 points in a grand final. For me, if I had sort of two vulnerabilities is with them. Of course, you got to cite hunger. Will this side be hungry enough to go again like they were in 2021? And I guess they lost Dan Burgess, their fitness coach, I believe, who has gone to the Adelaide Crows and I'm not really saying this will have a genuine impact in the first season. But obviously, one of the hallmarks of Melbourne's team last year was their ability to run out four quarters and push to the very end. So if that takes a hit, that could be a bit of a vulnerability for them. But I still think they're the best team in the comp and I can't have them any lower than first. To finish off the video, I'll rattle off a few of my other awards. I'm going to have Melbourne beating Brisbane in the grand final. I think I said that Brisbane would win the flag in my Druzy podcast prediction, but to be honest, it's hard to go past Melbourne. Brownlow medalist, I like to tip a tie. I think I tip a tie most years because it's just statistically it's due to happen and the chances are quite high. So I'm going to go with Clayton Oliver, who polled really well last year, and Jack Steele. 
Coleman medalist, I'm going to say Jeremy Cameron, if he can put together a full season, will be the Coleman medalist, even with Tom Hawkins in that side. The rising star, I'm going to go Nick Dacos, purely because I think he's probably going to play a lot of games for Collingwood. That, and he racked up 31 in a preseason game, so he obviously has no real trouble finding the ball. I know the intensity is going to be a bit different, but I think he'll play enough games, have that consistency. Maybe a Horn Francis spends a bit of time up forward for North, who knows? But I'm going to say Nick Dacos wins the rising star award. But that's it, guys. That is my ladder prediction. By all means, slate me in the comments like uh, like you always do every year but that's fine that's fine now nah, but it is just just a prediction just a bit of fun at the end of the day and i'm sure you know in a month into the season we're going to have vastly different views on some of these teams stay tuned for the podcast where we go into a bit more depth about each team as well probably going to talk for an hour and a bit uh, myself and busher just looking at the season as a whole really appreciate all the support from you guys as well and i haven't uploaded much over the off season but uh, the comments have been really kind and makes me want to get stuck back into it so i really appreciate you guys just make sure you subscribe to the channel that's all i ask and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.